family of journalist James Foley gathered for memorial mass in his hometown of Rochester, New Hampshire yesterday, five days after he was brutally murdered by militants calling themselves the Islamic State. That service was held on the same day that another American hostage was released. Peter Theo Curtis had been held for almost two years by the al-Nusra Front, a Syrian rebel group with ties to al-Qaeda. U.S. officials have said that they were not involved in private negotiations to secure his release through the Qatari government, and they don't know whether any ransom was paid. But the two cases raise significant questions about how or whether to negotiate with terrorist groups who take American hostages and how to handle their demands for ransom. My next guest is an expert on negotiation. Eileen Babbitt directs the International Negotiation and Conflict Resolution Program at the Fletcher School of Diplomacy at Tufts University. Welcome to Greater Boston. Thank you. Eileen, I want to ask you, the country and, of course, the family of Theo Curtis were overjoyed by the news of his release yes. yesterday, which was one spot, one bright spot after that horrific beheading of Jim Foley last week. Why do you think we saw two different outcomes, even though no ransom was paid, supposedly, in either case? I think the difference is, of course, the organizations that were holding these two gentlemen. Uh, ISIS, who was holding James Foley, um, it, is much more radical and is uh, probably not significantly interested in negotiating. They were probably making a, a much more um, a, a larger statement about public relations and not really negotiating in good faith. The other organization was clearly um, more interested in figuring out how to get rid of this captive and um, was uh, amenable to pressure from the Qataris who were mediating. So it was a Because the Qataris in the, fa in the past supposedly have funneled money to the anti-Assad opposition exactly. in Syria, which might include the al-Nusra Front, we don't know. Exactly, exactly. So they had more leverage with the, uh, the hostage takers and probably made it clear to them that it was no longer in their interests to hold Mr. Curtis. Also joining us today are Charlie Sennett. It's Charlie Sennett, a former colleague of mine from the Boston Globe years ago. He's co-founder of Global Post and the founder of the Ground Truth Project and a contributor to WGBH News. Thanks for joining us, Charlie. Thanks, Adira. I want to ask you um, to follow up a little bit on this question of what the al-Nusra Front's motives might have been. Do you think that in part this is about them trying to distinguish themselves from the Islamic State and perhaps fend off any airstrikes since there is mm -hmm. the possibility mm -hmm. that the U.S. the U.S. might actually go into Syria with some airstrikes against ISIS? Yeah, I think the al-Nusra Front um you know, is, is, I mean, this is conjecture, right? None of us know. But, I mean, if, if we're going to try to put together the pieces here, you would say that the El Nusra Front wants to be part of uh, the negotiating table when the war in Syria is over, whenever that will be. It certainly doesn't seem like it will be any time soon. But when it does end, they want to be at that table as part of the opposition. If they're going to be at that table, they cannot be associated with ISIS. ISIS is now uh, so outraged the world. What they have done is so barbaric that I think there is a, 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 a Even unanimity. Even Al-Qaeda has dismissed Even Al-Qaeda dismissed them as too radical. So this is a group that has gone off the rails, even in the treacherous terrain of Islamic extremism as it plays out in Syria. ISIS is in, a, is in a different school, a different class unto itself. So I think the Al-Nusra Front recognizes that, and I think they see gain in trying to give these hostages back. I think they also see fear. The United States would like to target them. And I think they see opportunity. The Qataris have funded them. They're willing to do their benefactors this favor. So we are so mixed lucky. mixed motives. Yeah, really very mixed motives. We're very lucky that Theo Curtis benefits from that and that he's mm -hmm. home. Uh, when I got the news of this, I was actually with uh, John Foley. This is mm -hmm. Jim Foley's father in New Hampshire at the funeral. Uh, and he had just received word. And it was so touching to see the Curtis family had reached out to the Foley family immediately with the news wow. and wanted to share with them that this had happened, but that is as joyful as they were, they were still grieving with the Foley's. Of and course. you know, there was a beautiful moment there. These, uh, these families have been through hell and they've been through hell together to some extent. They've gotten to know each other. There's been a sort of collegiality there that I think really plays with the Foley's strength and their faith. I think the world has seen that, how amazing they are. So, that moment was very touching yesterday. 
I want to bring Eileen back in. The U.S. says that it never negotiates with terrorists, mm -hmm. but we know that they did make a deal with the Taliban for the release of Sergeant Bo Bergdahl, an American military person who was held captive for several years in exchange for five Taliban militants who were being held at Guantanamo. Mm -hmm. Why make an exception in that case? Um, two reasons, I think. One is that there's been an evolution of the uh, relationship between the U.S. and the Taliban over the years and a recognition that they are a political actor and that some engagement with them is probably in the U.S. national interest. The second, I think, is the difference between paying sums of money and providing a prisoner exchange. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's less... Um, politically toxic, I think, to, now, that's do, to really... do the prisoner exchange than it is to lay out large amounts of cash that will finance a, that's a, a terrorist really interesting organization. Point. And I want to bring yeah. Charlie back in because on that question of terrorist mm -hmm. financing, we now know that kidnapping for ransom is a major source of financing for certain terrorist groups, including the Al-Qaeda affiliates in, in um, the Arabian Peninsula mm -hmm. and the Maghreb and also Abu Sayyaf in the mm -hmm. Philippines. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about this. When the U.S. and the British government say that is why you can never pay ransoms, mm -hmm. are they right? Um, you know, it's very hard to say who's right and wrong here. If you're as close to the Foley family as we've become, you understand their sense that they would do anything to save their son, including pay. I think that's the most human response on the planet. The U.S. policy, along with the British policy, also makes sense. This is smart. You don't pay terrorist money so that you can then have them go out and finance their operations. Think of the perverse incentives you create for more kidnapping. The Europeans are in, I think, the most questionable ground here, whereas they have a sort of pseudo-government policy that says we don't pay, but they turn a blind eye, and it's well known now that the Europeans did pay. Those hostages who were European had their governments take some role or turn a blind eye, as I say, to facilitate payments. What's, what's hard to say is what's right. What's important to look at is the long run, to pull yourself out of the emotion of the moment and the understandable desire for a family to do anything to save their child and say, what is the long run benefit here? I think basically this, this equation, this moral question is one of the toughest we face right now. And it's something that needs to be pulled out of the darkness and debated in a new light. Yeah, it is. Eileen, David Rode, a journalist who I worked with in Bosnia many years ago, was himself held hostage by the Taliban for about seven months. Now, we're told that apparently no ransom was paid in his case, but he was somehow able to make an escape. He wrote a really interesting column last week in which he essentially pointed the finger at the U.S. and British governments, saying if you're not paying ransoms when the French and the Spanish governments may be doing so under the table, that you're dooming American hostages to possible execution like this. What do you think of that and how would you advise governments to behave? I think actually the point is um, quite opposite to, to David's point. I understand why he would make this argument given his own circumstance, but if you set a precedent that you are willing to pay, then it seems to me it is um, more likely that your people will be taken, not not less likely. So um, the the uh, stance of the U.S. government and the U.K. not to pay ransom, I think, is a financial ransom is an actually sound policy. Well, that's well, a very difficult, a difficult question, especially for the families involved. Eileen yes. Babbitt, Charlie Sennett, thank you both so much for joining us.